there has been a verse up on the screen for the day, and it has been Hebrews 12, and that is the passage that we will get to look at in this last session. Rick Hoyt was born in 1962 and diagnosed as a spastic quadriplegic with cerebral palsy. His parents were advised to put him in, in an institution as there was little hope for him to live a normal life. But instead, his parents took him home and fought to treat him just like any other child. And they watched as he was not only able to learn the alphabet as a child, but, but when they got him an interactive com computer, he was able to communicate with them by typing out his answers. He completed high school from a public school. He earned a degree from Boston University. And one day, he asked his 36-year-old father at the time, Dick, if they could run in a race together to benefit an athlete who had become paralyzed to prove that life could go on regardless of your disability. His dad agreed and pushed his son's wheelchair the full five miles running. At the end of the race, Rick typed out, Dad, when I'm running, it feels like I'm not handicapped. And from then on, the father-son duo began competing in race after race with dad pushing Rick in a special wheelchair. They completed their first Boston Marathon in 1981. In 1988, they set their sights on the ultimate race, the Ironman Triathlon. It's a 2.4-mile swim, a 112-mile bike ride, and a marathon 26.2-mile run. For the swim, Dick pulled Rick mile after mile in a specialized raft behind him, attached by a bungee cord around his waist. He then picked up his son from the boat and ran with him to a special two-seater bike and secured him in the front custom-made seat. And then he biked with him all 112 miles. And finally, Dick transferred his son to an athletic wheelchair and ran with him for 26.2 miles. Dick says of his son, he's the one who has motivated me because if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be out there competing. What I'm doing out there is loaning Rick my arms and legs so he can be out there competing like everybody else. This father was motivated to run, bike, and swim mile after mile by his disabled son. He was motivated to endure these grueling tests of strength and stamina, and that motivation has allowed him to finish race after race. To date, this father-son team have completed 200 and 55 triathlons, 72 marathons, and a whole host of smaller races. They finally retired in 2014. Throughout the Bible, we see the Christian life compared to many things, a fight, a war. Um, and in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, it's described as a race. It's not just any race. The Greek word for that word race is agon. It's where we get our English word agony. It can also be translated as conflict, a conflict or a struggle or a fight. And it can be translated as a race. So it's a difficult race. And, it, and we know that even more because it says right in the middle, that main command, let us run with endurance, the race that is set before us. And we've, as we've seen that trials are a part of God's plan, and that we are equipped to respond to them, the question before us now is, well, how do we walk forward in them or how, how do we run forward in them? Serious athletes who undergo intense training and arduous obstacles, they do so because they are motivated by something. And if the Christian life is a lifelong spiritual Ironman and it requires endurance, we have to ask ourselves, what motivates us to run? In the same way that any time Dick would grow weary during those triathlons, all it would take was a glance back to the boy behind him to remember what his motivation was. We as runners need to know where we are to look for our motivation. And God in his kindness has given us three strategies, three helps to motivate us, to hold fast, to not give up, to keep running though the way gets hard and trials come. So read with me in Hebrews chapter 12, one through three. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. 
Hebrews is a great book from which to talk about trials because the people to whom it was written were experiencing them. These people were Jews, but they were Jews who had put their faith in Messiah and Jesus as Messiah and begun to follow after him. And there was a cost to this. Hebrews 10 tells us that at one point, these Hebrew readers um, joyfully accepted the plundering of their property since they knew they had a better possession and an abiding one. These believers had been running a good race up until this point, but now bigger trials were coming at them and, and fiercer persecution was coming because of their faith in Christ. And they were starting to question, was Jesus worth it? Was he really that much better than the religious system that they had just left, that Levitical system under Mosaic law, the one that they had been following for centuries? And all of a sudden, they were tempted to forsake this road that was getting narrower and more difficult with each passing day and turn back to their old way of life. So the writer of Hebrews spends the whole book encouraging his readers to hold fast, hold fast. And he does this by emphasizing just how much better Jesus is than anything else. Jesus is better than angels, he says. He's better than Moses. He is better than every high priest. Remember, the high priest was the person who would stand, as it were, between the sinner and God, interceding on their behalf, accepting a sacrifice and offering it to God. The author of Hebrews declares that Jesus is a much better high priest because unlike the others, he lives forever. And he wasn't just the high priest, he, he was the perfect sacrifice. All the other sacrifices had to be offered repeatedly over and over and over again. But Jesus in Hebrews 9, 26, it says, appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. This epistle is so interesting because the author of Hebrews doesn't appeal to philosophy or emotional arguments to motivate his readers to keep going, keep running. He doesn't try to convince them to hold on by appealing to their own resolve or inner strength. The only motivation the writer offers is Jesus is better. He is worth it. Mark Dever in his commentary on Hebrews says this, and this is the first point on your outline. He knows, the writer of Hebrews knows that if his readers are going to endure, they will endure because they believe these truths about Jesus, not because they have risen to the occasion through personal fortitude. And the same is true of us. If we are weary or discouraged or tempted to turn back to some other way, we need endurance like they did. And like them, if we are to run the race set before us with endurance, we will not do it because we are so great, but because he is. So in Hebrews 12, we find here a call to endure, to keep running. And the writer of Hebrews does this by offering three motivations. And here's the neat part. The same things that motivated those Hebrew readers so long ago, they motivate us as well today because these truths have not changed. The first motivation that he offers is this. We are motivated to run our race with endurance when we remember witnesses to emulate. When we remember witnesses to emulate. Hebrews 12.1 opens with a therefore. Now, many of us know this, but whenever we see a therefore, we want to ask, what is that therefore, therefore, right? What comes right before this? And the answer is Hebrews 11, which is another familiar chapter in the Bible. In Hebrews 11, we see Old Testament saint after Old Testament saint who by faith went through great adversity and trials, but held on even on to death. Sometimes this chapter is called the Faith Hall of Fame, and we see the author of Hebrews call his readers to endurance um, right before Hebrews 11. There's another call in 1036. He says, for you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. It's almost as if the writer is thinking of what tools he can offer his brothers and sisters to help motivate them to keep running and to endure. It's almost as if he's saying, you have need of endurance to receive what has been promised to you. Let me remind you of something that will help you endure. And then he gives this great list of regular flesh and blood men and women who believed the character and promises of God so much that they followed him at any cost. And right in the middle of Hebrews 11, there's a really sweet summary statement of these saints. In verse 13 of chapter 11, it says, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth. The names 
on this list died in faith, believing that there was something better waiting for them. And their lives on this earth reflected that faith. It says, having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth, for people who speak thus, make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Do you see yourself in this way? Do you see yourself as a stranger on this earth? The Apostle Paul did in Philippians 3 as he's counting everything as loss for the sake of knowing Christ. He says, but our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. My friends, this world is not our home. Our citizenship is in heaven. Are we living this way? Are we living in such a way that it might be said of us, she is seeking a homeland and it is not here. That's exactly how these saints in Hebrews 11 lived. And the writer of Hebrews points to these godly examples of living by faith as if to say, remember the faith Noah had and Moses? And similarly today, we can say after what we've talked about, remember Joseph and Elijah and Paul and Job and Jeremiah, even Matt? Remember how all these endured and how they were upheld? Therefore, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run our race. They are not here anymore, but we get to look to them as examples of those who held on, who did not give up, who kept running. Listen, these men and these women, they had hard circumstances. They had terrible trials. The winds blew and beat on their house, but they kept running. And this should motivate us to run. The language here is, is that of being surrounded by witnesses like we're runners in an arena. Like we're running in a race and we're in an arena and there's this great cloud of former runners, the legacy of whom echoes all around us and spurs us on to run even harder, bear up under even greater strain to run in the same way that they did. I want to run like Joseph and Job and Paul. God was faithful to each one of them and he will be faithful to me in the same way. So come trial, come difficulty, come suffering. If God caused their faith to be upheld so that they could continue running and finish their race, surely he will do the same for me. Jim Elliott, who was a missionary in Ecuador, was martyred by the tribe that he was um, trying to reach with the gospel in 1956. And he is one such witness that spurred me on to sell everything I have here, um, live as a stranger, as it were, and move to the jungles of Papua New Guinea. And similarly, the faithfulness of, of Elizabeth Elliot, his, wi his wife, his widow, um, who persevered both in missionary work and being used for God for the gospel long after she left Ecuador, has spurred me on in the days since Matt died. We are called to look to the faithful examples of saints who ran before us or who are running beside us today and be spurred on to emulate them. So the first motivation here is that we are motivated to run when we remember witnesses to emulate. The second motivation is this. We are motivated to run when we look to Jesus to escape and endure. In instructing his readers of what will help them run, the author of Hebrews tells them first what will not help them run. And we see this in verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. In the same way that it wouldn't help a runner to be weighed down by layers of clothing and, and ankle weights, so also the writer of Hebrews tells us that sin is not our friend. Sin will not help us run. Now, it's interesting because we've been talking a lot about how we're called not to look for escape first and most in our circumstances. But as I was uh, studying for this and sitting with my Bible and thinking through it, I realized that there, there is something that the Bible does tell us to escape. If you flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, we read this. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. We are called to escape temptation. 
And look at where the hope for this escape is found. It says, it says God is faithful. He will not let, let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape. This is a promise that every single time I am tempted, God is faithful and promises two things here. One, that I won't ever be tempted beyond my ability. And two, that he will always provide a way of escape. But there's one other observation about this verse that has really helped me recently in my battle with temptation and sin. And if I were to ask you not to look at the verse, but try to quote it from memory, um, at least for me, I might say, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape. But there's another phrase at the end of that verse. Do you see it? He will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Every one of us in this room, I think, would always rather escape temptation than endure it. Lord, please just take this temptation away from me. I don't want to want it anymore. I've been struggling with the same thing for weeks, for months, for decades. Pride or lust or anger or slander or anxiety, there are besetting sins and it would just be great if, if those temptations were removed from us altogether. The 1 Corinthians 10.13 is telling us that we need to have a category for escaping temptation, not by it magically disappearing, but by us enduring it, by us enduring through it. Sometimes escaping temptation looks like enduring through it. What God is promising here is not that we will not be tempted. The very fact that this verse is in our Bible and tells us that no temptation has overtaken us except what is common to man tells us that we will be tempted. He is not saying that he will be faithful to remove the temptation from us, but what he is promising is that he will be faithful to provide a way of escape for us that we may be able to endure it. Do we have a category for this? When you're in the midst of temptation, do you have a category for escape from that temptation through enduring it? And isn't that what Jesus did? Let's ask ourselves, did Jesus ever endure temptation? How often did Jesus escape temptation by enduring it? And the answer is 100% of the time because he, he never gave in. How long did Jesus have to escape temptation by enduring it? Well, we know that there was a specific time after 40 days in the wilderness where he was tempted and had to endure that temptation. But Hebrews 4.15 says that he was tempted in every respect as we are yet without sin. Really, the whole time he was on this earth, he endured temptation and never gave in. The very fact that he never gave in means that he endured every temptation longer than we could. And that is comforting for our hearts. The writer of Hebrews is not just concerned that his readers endure trials. He is also aware of the temptations that they face and the weakness and the discouragement that they bring with them. And he points them to Jesus, not just in their trials, but also in their temptations. We spoke earlier of how the writer of Hebrews pointed to Jesus as a far better high priest, right? An, inner, an interceding, someone to intercede between the sinner and God. And under the Mosaic law, when an Israelite would bring his sacrifice to the high priest, there would be a certain measure of comfort in knowing that that high priest was also a sinner and could understand the weakness um, could understand that sin. And what the author of Hebrews points out is that Jesus actually understands our temptations and our weaknesses far better than any human high priest ever could because we do not have a great high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Knowing that he is the son of God and able to sympathize with all of our weaknesses, then the next verse says in Hebrews 4.16, it says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We are to bring all of our sin and all of our shame and all of our guilt and we are called to draw near without fear because Jesus is our great high priest, because he always lives to intercede for us and because on his face when we draw near to him, there is sympathy, not scorn, and there is mercy not judgment, because he already bore the judgment for us on the cross. It is a throne of grace. 
Hebrews 2, 17 says something similar. It says, therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus suffered when he was tempted and he endured it. And so he is able to help us in our weakness, in our temptation. He's able to give us the grace that we need to escape our temptation through enduring it. Do you know this? When you are beset by temptation or when you find sin clinging closely to you, do you run to the one who endured every temptation so that he might help you with yours? We take heart and with confidence we draw near to that throne of grace over and over and over again. And over and over and over again, we find mercy and grace to help in our time of need from the one who became that sin and rose victorious over it three days later. Does this motivate us to run? Do we say to ourselves, I can't run very fast. I have all this sin clinging to me. We look to Jesus because he promises grace and mercy to throw it off and lay it aside so that we can run our race with endurance. But the verse doesn't just say to lay aside sin. The first part of it in Hebrews 12 says to lay aside every weight. And the instruction here is not just to get rid of the out and out sin, the blatant sin, but to get rid of everything that threatens to, to slow us down. John Piper says about this verse, what this says is don't just ask, what's wrong with it? Don't just ask, is it a sin? That's about the lowest question you can ask in life. So what question should we ask if it's not, is it a sin? And the answer is we ask, does it help me run? Does it get in my way when I'm trying to become more patient, more kind, more gentle, more loving, more holy, more pure, more self-controlled? Does it get in my way or does it help me run? If it doesn't help us run, we lay it aside. And we do this by looking to Jesus who freed us from the slavery to it and he will not abandon us now as we still struggle in it. We look to Jesus to escape temptation and this should motivate us to run. So we are motivated to run when we look to Jesus to escape temptation, but we're also motivated to run when we look to him to endure trials. And this is what we've been talking about. You see how he's described here. It says, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus. We're gonna skip this phrase and come back to it in a minute. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint hearted. Looking to Jesus. Very seldom in the New Testament epistles do we see the name Jesus all by itself without Lord or Christ next to it. And this is the writer's way of emphasizing Jesus' humanity, that he actually became a real man and endured real trials and real temptations to redeem us. Looking to Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Do you see how the agony of the cross is side by side, right next to the victory here, being seated at the right hand of the throne of God? Our hope for enduring our trials is not by looking at them first and most, because there is no hope when we fix our eyes on our circumstances any more than there might be hope for a runner to fix his eyes on the rocks and stones in his path. Of course, he has to look at them to go over them or around them, but his eyes don't stay there. He fixes his eyes up on something ahead of him, and Hebrews 12 tells us that we are to fix our eyes on Jesus. And why? Why do we do that? Because this race that we run is ultimately not about us. It's not about our glory. It is about his that verse that we read earlier in 1 Peter about the tested genuineness of our faith, um, that it might be found to result in praise and glory and honor, not for us, but for him at the revelation of Christ Jesus. This race was and it still is about the one who ran his race perfectly so that we could be freed to run ours at all. And do you see how it says, for the joy that was set before him, we press on and endure the hard things we face because he endured far more difficult things with far more joy. There was joy even in the most agonizing of nights, that night that we looked at in Gethsemane because of the promise of what lay on the other side of the cross. Every one of these saints that we have talked about today would have run in vain had it not been for this one runner, for Jesus. We consider that one who endured 
from sinners, hostility against himself so that we do not grow weary or faint-hearted. Does this motivate us to run? When we are hard-pressed in our circumstances, do we look to Jesus who endured far worse with far more joy as our high priest and we pluck up our courage and we lift up our heads and we run our race with endurance? We look to Jesus to escape temptation and to endure trials and we are motivated to keep running. So we're motivated to run when we remember witnesses to emulate. We're motivated to run when we look to Jesus to escape temptation and to endure trials. And maybe you're sitting here and you're thinking, why? Sounds like an awfully hard life. Throwing off the sin that promises so much pleasure and accepting a whole lot of hardship. That doesn't sound like gain to me. That sounds a lot more like loss. And that's why this last motivation is so important. We are motivated to run when we anticipate heaven to hold fast. If we were running a race that had no end, that just went on and on, up hills, through valleys, no finish line, no prize, no reward, um, then it would be very accurate to say of us, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But this is not the case. We are not running aimlessly and we're also not running forever. We are running for something. We are running for a finish line and for a reward. And it is the most glorious finish line and the most incomprehensibly wonderful reward than we could ever imagine. We are running for that which Matt used his last breath talking about, that inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for us. And we are running for eternal life. This inheritance and the citizenship that we talked about earlier, they're already there. They're already waiting for us to endure this race and to cross that finish line. As often as the author of Hebrews directs us to look back to the cross and to Jesus' perfect sacrifice, he also directs us to look forward, to anticipate heaven as a motivation for his readers to hold fast. Listen to some of the different ways in which heaven is mentioned in the book of Hebrews. It is described multiple times as God's rest for us, as our promised eternal inheritance, as a better possession and an abiding one, as a great reward, as the city that has foundations, as opposed to living in tents, whose designer and builder is God, as our homeland, as a better country, a heavenly one, as a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And that is not to mention every time the word hope is used as that to which we cling in this life as our confidence for the next. Hebrews 6, 11 finds the writer saying to have the full assurance of hope until the end. And why? So that we can be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And a few verses after that, he points out that because of the unchangeable nature of our God who gives us these promises, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope that is set before us. There is a hope set before us as we run this race. Do you have this hope? Do you hold fast to it? Faith is defined in Hebrews 11.1 1, as the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith by definition, is believing and being confident of that hope which we cannot see. And if you're looking for where hope, real hope, is found on this earth, you will not find it because it's not found here. It is found in one place and one place only, and that is in Jesus Christ, our hope of eternal life. And this hope, it will never disappoint us. It will never put us to shame. And you might say, I'd like to have more of that hope. Romans 5 tells us what produces hope. And that's character. And then we ask, well, what produces character? Endurance. And what produces endurance? Suffering. And knowing this, Paul writes, produces joy. He writes in Romans 5 that we don't only rejoice in hope of the glory of God through Jesus Christ, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Why? Why would we ever rejoice in suffering? Because we know something, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame. Look, suffering is difficult and it is painful and I have seen part of it. Some of you have walked through deep waters in even recent weeks and these truths do not take away that pain. I've had many opportunities to apply these truths which I've gotten to share with you today. 
Like I said, I fought like Jeremiah to rein in the wild horses of my thoughts and stay them on truth, sometimes successful, sometimes not as much. There's a precious verse in Psalm 112.7 that says that the righteous man is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. And there were a lot of days, especially when my husband was sick, that I was so afraid of bad news. <laughs> but I would tell myself this verse over and over and over again until I believed it. And God always gave me the grace to believe it and not to be afraid of bad news. And similarly, Psalm 118, 24 says, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Matt and I would tell each other this verse on the very worst of those days because we knew it was still true. This was still the day that the Lord had made. We could still rejoice and be glad in it because he was still good. And we'd just tell each other that over and over and God was always kind to give us some part of joy. And on hard nights, especially earlier on when I would cry more often, I would look myself in the mirror and I would just be like, Cameron, you just need to go to sleep. You need to go to sleep and you need to trust that God's mercies are gonna be new in the morning. And they have been new every single morning. So it's been almost two years since Matt died and God has been faithful every day since then. Um, there, are, there are these Hallmark movies where the guy and the girl, they're like apart for the whole movie. And then like literally in the last 30 seconds, they get together. And like, and then, then the credits roll. And you're like, you have no confidence it's gonna last, you know? And so your question, your question is just like, where is the epilogue? Did it last? You know, there's no confidence. Like 99% of those movies. So the question is, like, has God's faithfulness lasted? It lasted during those six months, right, to sustain us and to sustain Matt, to sustain, sustain myself. And, and listen, the truth is, is that, is that it, it's lasted. God has been faithful every moment since then. He has not left me or forsaken me. He has not left my children. The rock upon which I stand, it hasn't moved or budged, not an inch. He is still good to me. He still loves me, and he has done us no wrong. God's love for me is so great that it will never even increase. <laughs> it will never decrease, but it also never increase because the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. It's always just the same. And that doesn't mean that it's still hard. Suffering is still hard. Hence the material for three sessions of speaking. I would read these truths of God's word again and again and again and again. That saying, practice what you preach, for me, the fight to believe these things has looked a lot more like preach until you practice. <laughs> I just would preach and preach and preach to my heart um, until, until I believed it and until God gave me grace to practice that. And he's been kind to do that. These truths, they do not take away the pain of difficult circumstances. They do not fix our broken circumstances. They do not magically ease the grief or stop the tears or make the hurting go away or heal relationships that you've been praying for for years. There are deep waters in this life and I've only waded through a small portion of them. The promise here is not that it'll be easy. It's quite the opposite. Following Jesus in this world often makes life harder. It certainly did for the Hebrews to whom this letter was written. The promise here is that amidst the, the, the frothing, tossing waves of this life, we have a sure and steadfast anchor of our soul and it will not move. We don't lose heart because the trials or afflictions will stop. Um, that's not where our hope is. Our hope is found someplace much greater than any one trial stopping because then the next one will start. The reason we don't lose heart is because there is something better coming. This life here is not all that there is. This world is not our home. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with him and bring us with you into his presence. Man, being brought into the presence of Jesus, the one who knows everything about you and loves you and died for your sin. He is our treasure and he is our hope. And then he says in Paul, in that same passage, he says, so we don't lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. There is an eternal weight of glory awaiting us. So much so that someday 
I will be able to look at the death of my very best friend and say, light and momentary. I'm not sure I can say that just yet, as I'm sure many of you in this room would also struggle to say that about the trials ongoing in your life. But I know that someday I will say that. I know that that is true because God always keeps his promises. We asked the question at the beginning of this session, what does it look like for us to walk forward in our trials, to run this race with endurance? So we're gonna go back to that phrase that we skipped over in Hebrews 12, and then we'll be done. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Jesus is the founder, or other translations say the author of our faith. He started it. He gave it to us. But he is also the perfecter of it, meaning he will be faithful to finish it. That faith that each of those saints that we've talked about today and every single saint on this list in Hebrews 11 had, it did not originate in them. Jesus was the author of their faith just as surely as he is the author of our faith. He began a good work in us, but the unspeakably wonderful news is that he never starts a work in one of his children that he is not faithful to complete. He is the founder of our faith, but the promise here is that he's also its perfecter. In Philippians 1.6, the Apostle Paul says something similar. He says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. This is good news. <laughs> because if he began a good work in you, he will complete it. Not because you are so able, or I am so able, because we're not, but because he is faithful. I don't know if any of you have ever gotten to watch this happen in someone's life, watching God finish the work he began in them. I don't know, um, I've only gotten to see one. In God's kindness, I got to watch God finish the work that he began in my husband. And in the months and weeks leading up to his death, I would say that that man just ran harder and faster for that finish line and for that prize. And by God's grace, he endured so well. And I've often asked myself, how did he do that? I mean, I know God's grace, um, but how, how did he do that? Uh, I would like to do that. How did he do that? And as I've thought about it, I'd say that the way Matt Dodd endured so well is by holding on to two things uh, simultaneously, that he endured by looking back to the cross and looking forward to heaven. And he held both of those things. And this is how we are to endure, not because that's what he did, but because this is what we see in scripture. We see in the book of Hebrews, appointing back to Jesus as our great high priest, as, his, as our perfect sacrifice. We see appointing back to the cross, and then we see an anticipation of heaven to running for our reward for the city that has foundations. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. We see this throughout the whole New Testament. 1 Peter 1 um, is just a really sweet passage that I think encapsulates this race. If you were gonna, if you were gonna see what this race looks like for us, um, in 1 Peter 1, it says this, and I'm gonna read through verse nine, starting in verse three. It says, "'Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, "'according to his great mercy, "'he has caused us to be born again to a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls." Our salvation is secure, but one day when our faith is made sight, it will be complete. We will have received all of the benefits of that salvation when we cross that finish line. This is how we are motivated to run, 
We remember witnesses to emulate. We look to Jesus to both escape temptation and to endure trials. And we anticipate heaven to hold fast. We look back to the cross and we look forward to heaven and we hold both of those things. And the focal point of both of those things is Jesus. The song that we will sing for all eternity is not glory to us, it is glory to him for how he has purchased us to the lamb that was slain. Are we doing this? When your car breaks down or your kids are late to school, do you look back to the cross that Jesus bore and remember that your heaviest burden has already been lifted from your shoulders and thus you can entrust the smaller burdens of today to his loving care? Or when the child for whom you have hoped and prayed and dreamed and planned is suddenly gone, a miscarriage, do you entrust that loss to the one who knows loss? To the one who has a plan and a purpose for it that promises good things to come from it and promises to give you grace in the midst of it? And then do you look forward to heaven where you will one day be able to look back on the very worst this world has to offer and say, light and momentary, because of the infinite grace you will just be beginning to experience in the presence of your Savior. Or when temptation comes and you find yourself struggling once again with that same sin and you've been fighting for months and decades and you are wearied by that same battle and discouraged by the weakness of your flesh, do you do this? Do you look back to the cross and remember that all that sin was already paid for by Jesus? Do you remember that he endured far more temptation for far longer so that he might sympathize with our weaknesses today and help us with them? And then do you look forward to heaven where one day that faith that seems so precarious sometimes in times of temptation here will be at times, will be perfected once for all? Do we know these things? Do they motivate us to run? Your trials look different from my trials and they look different from the trials sitting next to you, but the solution is the same. We run this race and we are spurred on to do so by the saints before us and around us. We look to Jesus in our trials and our temptations and we trust that he will give us all the grace that we need to endure. And we look to heaven and we remind ourselves that this world is not our home. We have a better hope, a homeland and a heavenly one. If you are here and you would say that you're not sure that you have this hope in heaven, can I just tell you that God offers that to you today? He made a way for you to be saved at the cost of his own son, to be reconciled to him, but you have to first recognize that you need saving, that you need the righteousness that only he can provide, and he has provided it abundantly in his son. Or maybe you're here this morning and you are discouraged or you're just weary because of the trials that the Lord has you in. <sighs> can I just encourage you that you can consider your trials joy, not because of what you feel, but because of what you know, that God is producing something good in them. That he does things in trials he does nowhere else to make our faith steadfast and to get to see his faithfulness. It'll take endurance. This race that we run, this life here will take much endurance, but it is worth it. Look to Jesus who lived for you and died for you and rose again so you could have a hope someplace where cancer and death and disease and trouble can't touch. Our God is sovereign and he's good and he loves us so much he did not spare his own son for us. We can trust him in whatever storm that comes. And when those storms come, there's just nothing sweeter than to cling to that sure and steadfast anchor of our souls and watch it hold fast. And we emerge from that storm more confident than before. And we, we emerge from that storm more confident in that which we placed our hope, knowing even more that the God who was faithful in yesterday's storms will be faithful in today's trials. And he will one day bring us safely to our hope for tomorrow. Strong women are not those who dig down deep in themselves and find the resolve and the resources to keep running and keep pushing forward. They are those who have the wisdom to know that one day their resolve and their resources will run out. And they have the faith to build their lives upon something much stronger than themselves. Our strength and our resources will run out, but his never will. So we believe these truths about Jesus. And we throw our life upon that rock and we watch it hold again and again and again. And that's faith. 
Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. May we run today like we are strangers on earth and citizens in heaven. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the truth of your word that never changes, for the rock that never moves and the, the anchor that holds fast. Lord, whether we are here today and, um, and we are in a storm or whether we are not, Lord, I pray that we would hold fast to these truths, Lord, that promise to hold fast to us. They will never change in the same way that you will never change. The greatest problem that we could ever have in this world is not a trial or, or suffering, Lord. It is ultimately our sin and the wrath that you have against that sin. And oh, may we look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who took that sin upon his shoulders and gave us his righteousness, Lord. May we be spurred on by these witnesses that we've talked about today, by these saints, to run this race that you have for us with endurance. And may we just look to you as we run, Jesus. May we look back to Calvary and forward to heaven and hold fast to those things and trust that you will give us grace to finish this race and to cross that finish line because you are good and you are faithful and you always keep your promises. It's in the name of Jesus we pray, amen.